In the last video we talked about the traditional view of Isaiah 7.14. About the old virgin will conceive and bear a son and we'll call his name Emmanuel. Objections to the traditional view include the following. One, prediction of the Messiah doesn't really fit the context very well. What assurance would it give to Ahaz that Messiah would be born 700 years down the road and before that Messiah re reaches a certain age of development that the, the land of those two kings will be forsaken? It would be uh, of no benefit to him in the context of the prophecy. Moreover, the prophecy is in the context of the situation of the syro ephraimite war. The verse right after the Emmanuel verse says, Before the boy is old enough to reject the bad and choose the good, the land of these two kings, clearly in reference to uh, Pekka of uh, Israel and Rezin of Syria, the land of these two kings will be laid to waste. And as a matter of fact, if it were a child born in Ahaz's day, well, before that child could be uh, conceived and born and uh, reach a stage of development of rejecting the bad and choosing the good, uh, that would be two or three years. And within three years of the prophecy in 732 B.C., both Pekka and Ahaz had been deposed by Tiglath-Pileser. The critical view goes on to say that the word translated virgin is mistranslated. That the Hebrew word alma means not virgin so much as young woman. Now a young woman could be a virgin, but that it doesn't denote a virgin. So the New Revised Standard Version translates it young woman rather than virgin. Moreover, they uh, point out that the word does have the article, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Well, who would the virgin with the article be? It must be a well-known virgin that the court would be aware of who it was. Again, that would fit better with uh, Emmanuel being a child born in Isaiah's day rather than uh, long future Messiah. Moreover, and at this point we can add to the critical view a particular version of it, you can make the case that Emmanuel is to be identified with another child in the immediate context, a child by the name of Maher Shalal Hashbaz. In chapter 8 and verse 1 it says, Then the Lord said to me, Take a large tablet and write on it in common characters belonging to Maher Shalal Hashbaz, and I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest, and Zechariah the son of uh, uh, Jerber Rekiah, to attest for me. And I went to the prophetess, and she conceived, and she bore a son. And then the Lord said to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz, before, for before the boy knows how to cry, My father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Now what's going on in this Isaiah 8 passage? Well, Isaiah 8 is giving what arguably could be a marriage contract pertaining to Isaiah's second wife, his fiancée. And in that marriage contract, it says that the first child is going to be named Maher Shalal Hashbaz. The first son would be named Maher Shalal Hashbaz of that marriage union. But Maher Shalal Hashbaz is none other than the Emmanuel of, of uh, Isaiah 7.14. She calls him by the positive name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God is with us. 
but he, Isaiah, calls him by the judgment name, Maher Shal Hashbaz, which in Hebrew means quick goes the plunder, fast goes the booty. Now, was she a virgin? Well, she would have been a virgin at the time of the prophecy, but not at the time of the birth of the child, because it indicates that uh, I went to the prophetess and she conceived. It's a reference to natural procreation. And so that could fit in well with the critical view. But that critical view could be modified in a way that makes it more acceptable to uh, conservative Christians. So let me offer you the, this third view, which is a alternative view that in some ways splits the difference between the traditional view and the critical view. Start off by accepting that the critical view has made its case that Emmanuel in the first instance, instance is referring to a child born during the days of Isaiah and Ahaz king of Judah. But when Matthew quotes it in uh, Matthew 123 and says uh, uh, concerning Mary uh, conceiving by the Holy Spirit thus is fulfilled that which is written by the prophet uh, behold a virgin shall conceive and uh, bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God is God with us, that uh, Matthew is quoting this not as a prediction fulfillment, but rather as a typological fulfillment. And it turns out that Matthew does this in other passages. So if you go to the next chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15, he quotes uh, in conjunction with uh, Jesus uh, having fled to Egypt, returning back to Judah after the death of Herod, thus is fulfilled that which is written by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. That's a quote of Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. Clearly in context, Hosea 11 and verse 1 is a statement of historical fact about how God called Israel, who he also calls his son, out of Egypt. That would have been very clear to any ancient reader that uh, read it at all in context. And Matthew would have understood that too. But what Matthew sees in addition is a typology, a God-intended analogy between Israel and Jesus. Jesus came to be Israel's perfect representative. As Israel's perfect representative, he even experiences some of the things that Israel experienced. So just as Israel went to Egypt, so Jesus went to Egypt. Just as Israel was tested in the wilderness for 40 years, so Jesus is tested in the wilderness for 40 years days, just as Israel passed through the waters of the Red Sea, so Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. Just as Israel had 12 sons, so Jesus had 12 apostles. And so in order for Jesus to be Israel's perfect representative, uh, he even experiences some of the things that Israel experienced historically. And that's, I believe, what Matthew sees when he says, thus is fulfilled. is fulfilled not as a direct prediction. That wasn't what Hosea was speaking about when he wrote. But it does fulfill typologically the analogy between Israel and Christ. Other places, Matthew does a similar sort of thing. In uh, Matthew 2.18, it quotes uh, Jeremiah 31.15, which speaks of Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. In Matthew, is quoted in conjunction with the killing of the innocents 
by Herod's men in Bethlehem. In Jeremiah, uh, Rachel, who was the patriarchal wife in Genesis, metaphorically weeps for her children, Ephraim and Manasseh, who had been slaughtered and deported by the Assyrians. And what Matthew sees here, since it's very clear uh, what Jeremiah is talking about is not a prediction of Messiah or things uh, pertaining to Messiah, what Matthew seems to be saying is that, well, this language is fulfilled in the sense that it's filled up again, that it applies again to an analogous situation. And so, thus is fulfilled that which is written by the prophet is not a prediction fulfillment. It's even somewhat softer than uh, typological fulfillment. And so, when Matthew uh, 123 says, thus is fulfilled uh, uh, that which is written by the prophet, uh, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, and applies it to uh, the Virgin Mary, who had conceived by the Holy Spirit, uh, what is seeing is a typological analogy between Emmanuel and Jesus. Maher Shalal Hashbaz and Emmanuel symbolized that God was with Ahaz. But Jesus is really Emmanuel, God with us, in that he really is God with us. In Isaiah's time, there was an Alma, a young woman, in social context, that would certainly imply a virgin. They didn't fool around much in those days. Uh, there was a virgin who was pregnant. Rather odd language. That's literally what it says. The virgin is pregnant. In context, it means a woman who is currently a virgin will become pregnant. And if it's Isaiah's wife, well, she wasn't a virgin by the time of the birth. But in the typology, it anticipates a pregnant virgin, Mary, who is literally and miraculously a pregnant virgin, thus literally fulfilling this odd language of Isaiah. In other words, uh, Emmanuel foreshadows Christ, but the language that's applied to Emmanuel applies to, to Jesus in a far richer and deeper and more wonderful way. The Alma, or virgin, in Isaiah refers to Isaiah's fiance, whom Isaiah is about to marry. The sign is that the child of this union, whom the mother will call Emmanuel and the father will call Maher Shalah Hashbaz, will serve as a measure of the time at which these two powers troubling Ahaz, uh, Rezin and Pekah, would no longer be on the scene. And in fact, this comes true. Uh, between 735 and 734, when the prophecy was made within a couple of years, in 733-732, the king of Syria and the king of Israel were both dead, and Assyria was in control. Yet this Emmanuel foreshadows a greater Emmanuel, who will fulfill this prophecy in a richer and deeper and more wonderful way than does Isaiah's son, Maher Shalal Hashbaz. We'll say more in the next video.